So as most of you are aware, we're working through a series um, that Brad began last week, Pastor Brad began last week, on Jesus, seeing Jesus in the Old Testament. Was anybody paying attention to the verses that were written, or read, sorry, for you? Where were they from? Hebrews, Colossians, and John. Adam was paying attention. The gold star for Holly, who told Adam <laughs> where they were. That wasn't the Old Testament. Um, and I hope as, as we go through these verses, it, it helps us uh, understand why I chose them and how it helps us in reading through the Old Testament. When we begin talking about looking to Jesus in the Old Testament, uh, let's start at the beginning. Help me out here because the beginning is a very good place to start. When you read, you begin with... When you read, you begin with... When you sing, you begin with... Oh, that, that, do, re, mi, oh, sorry. When you study the Old Testament, you begin with Genesis 1, 2, and 3. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The message today is not so much about how, but rather who and why. When Rachel read the last text from the beginning of the book of John, did you note how verse 1 of chapter 1 started? In the beginning. John uses this intentionally to help the reader draw back to the very first verse of the Pentateuch, which is Genesis 1-1, In the beginning, God. So my three points to my sermon today that we're going to walk through in as we look to looking at the Old Testament and how we find Jesus in the Old Testament. Another clip. We're good. That'll hold it there. Yep. Thanks. Maybe. Now it goes the other way. There we go. Uh, three points today is uh, the task that I've been given to is, is talking about how Jesus is the word, Jesus is the creator, and Jesus is the sustainer. Jesus is the word. When John uses the, the, the phraseology of in the beginning was the word, in our context today, that's that's kind of a weird terminology. We we wouldn't talk like that. So what is what does John mean when he says, "In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God." Logos, the word translated to word, for the original readers of the Greek and Hebrew, when understood of in light of John's connection to the Old Testament, is referring to God's powerful activity in creation, revelation, and deliverance. So as you read through the Old Testament, when the word of the Lord comes, it comes in circumstances of God's creation, God's self-revelation, and his deliverance. John, in using the word, is directly connecting Jesus to the Old Testament use of the word in saying Jesus was God's word, God's creation, God's powerful creation and activity in creation, revelation and deliverance. D.A. Carson defines the word as God's word is his powerful self-expression in creation, revelation, and salvation. John is saying Jesus is God's ultimate self-disclosure. 
the word was presented in the beginning of time with God and actually is God. When we read the account, hey guys, when we read the account of a Genesis in light of the New Testament, it is clear that as um, was written in Genesis, that the days of creation, God speaks. And what happens when God speaks? Anybody? Things are created. It's specifically what he says is actually created, right? Any of you ever try to put together a recipe and you taste it and it's like, mm, not what I was thinking was going to happen. When God speaks, when Jesus speaks, what he says comes to being. Why is it important for us to believe Jesus is the word? Jesus is God's most powerful ultimate self-expression in creation and revealing himself and salvation. Jesus is God's ultimate self-disclosure. And the words of, and deeds of Jesus are the words of God. When Jesus speaks, God is speaking. Jesus declares in the Gospels that he doesn't say anything that the Father hasn't given him to say. Therefore, understanding Jesus' words are God's words should help us and they should be paid very careful attention to. If Jesus is God and Jesus speaks and the words that Jesus speaks are God's, they should be paid very careful attention to. So the question comes, do you listen to Jesus? Do you listen to Jesus? Now, you might say, I go to a Christian church that believes in Jesus, right? Jesus is my savior. But does Jesus speak into your life? More specifically, does Jesus speak into every aspect and area of your life? Jesus was the one who spoke and created trees, grass, birds, sky, ground, fish, animals. All of creation was spoken by him. Massively powerful. He speaks in his word. Do you listen? Jesus created you to listen to him. Jesus is the word spoken from God to us. Secondly, Jesus is the creator. In Hebrews and Colossians and John, each of the three authors are at the very beginning of the books or letters that they are writing. And they're establishing Jesus as the creator. In Hebrews, Long ago, many times, in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he's spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed heir over all things, through whom also he created the world. Colossians. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in earth, or sorry, in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him. And in John, all things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. Jesus is the creator. It's interesting to note that at the beginning of each of these letters, the authors intentionally put Jesus as the creator of the world. Jesus is the one who spoke everything into existence. What follows in these books and letters is instruction, correction, directions, encouragement for people who are created by Jesus. 
for them to pay careful attention to. And honestly, all humans were created, designed to pay attention to God, to listen to Him, to be in relationship with Him. In Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 and 27, we see that God created humanity to image Him, to reflect His image, to reflect His character, to image His likeness. Not even, uh, as we go through Scripture, it's not even just us as humans that are to, uh, um, and, and sorry, in our imaging Him, we are declaring His glory. We're declaring His ultimate being, the ultimate good of the universe, which gives Him glory, gives Him weightiness as who He is as God. Throughout Scripture, not just humans, but the whole cosmos gives God glory. Psalm 19, verses 1 and 2. The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of His hands. It is the design of creation to bring glory to the one who created it. My boys are fascinated with Teslas. Right? Who gets all the glory for Teslas? Elon Musk, because I'm sure he was the only one engineer working on it, right? You look at the beauty of the kids around us, right? You look at a couple of them over here, and you're like, yeah, I know who their parents are, because they image their parents, right? Humanity was created to image God, to reflect Him in His likeness. Not just because we look like Him with eyes and nose, but in our character. Out of an overflow of love, God created humanity. And it's when we act like He has acted that we display His goodness, His character, His glory. I want you to think for but a moment what it might take to speak anything into existence. Like, I can't even speak my kid's obedience into existence, let alone a blade of grass, right? A blue sky that's not really blue, but it's blue because of good scientific reasons, right? I, I encourage you at some point in time on your mobile device or your, um, uh, and your computer at home to search up Louis, Louis Giglio uh, in some of his conferences, has done some, some amazing work just describing the expanse of the universe that was spoken into existence. I want you to think for a moment of the wisdom in design. Okay, I want everybody, I've done this before, but do it again. If you have sunglasses, I want you to lift them off your head for a moment. I want you to look into somebody else's eyes. Everybody look into somebody's eyes. Now, if you put your hand over their eyes, right, and you take it away in the dark, can't do it right now, it's not really going to work, what happens to their eye, or if you take a bright light and you shine it in it, what happens? Shannon, what happens when you're checking pupils with that little light? They constrict. What happens in the dark? They dilate. Pretty amazing. Pretty amazing that your eye is almost simple in comparison to the eye of an eagle, right? Flying how many miles up can spot a, a little mouse running camouflage through grass. Designed by your creator, spoken into existence. Why is it important 
to understand Jesus, why is it important to believe Jesus as the creator? Let's be honest. The creator of anything holds rights and privileges over its creation as the creator of that very thing. Likewise, just as we would not use, I've used this before and it's all that comes to my mind. I've tried all week to find another illustration working in aviation world to use an airplane as a snowplow is not what the airplane was designed for. And what would happen if we used an airplane as a snowplow? What's that? No plane? Plane would be busted, broke. Was not designed for it. The designer of the airplane would shake their head and say, what are you doing? Jesus created all humanity, all cosmos, and therefore has every right to be authority over all that is created as creator. We see Jesus in the New Testament, in the Gospels, exercise that authority over creation. When he came into the world, he spoke out demons. He calmed the waters of a raging sea with the words, be still. And those that were there recognized the authority that Jesus had over the waves of the sea. Sicknesses departed because Jesus has authority over all creation. He has authority over you and I, both in our design and our purpose. He designed you to live and be in existence to display his glory. Is this not real freedom? A freedom to be free to do the very thing you were designed to do? Young fellows, ladies, who are trying to figure out life's path before you, your purpose in living, is it not freeing that you don't have to figure out your purpose in life? Isaiah and Isaiah 43, 7 says that you were created along with all creation to give God glory in everything you do. So whether you're a doctor, an athletic therapist, a police officer, right? Nurse, doctor, church planters, stay-at-home moms, right? In everything you were designed and created to bring God glory. Because this is the reason for which you were created. To give him glory by displaying his character to each other and the world around us. In delighting him as your ultimate good, not the things that he created. Isn't this what went wrong? Romans tells us, in, Paul tells us in, Rome, in his letter to the Romans in chapter 1, that we were created to worship God and God alone. But the problem that has happened is we've inverted worship for the Creator to those things in which he created So not only did he create all things, Jesus is the one who sustains all things. Back in Colossians and Hebrews, all things were created through him and for him, and he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. In John, Sorry, in Hebrews, verse 3, Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3. He upholds the universe by the word of his power. So I want you to think for but a moment. Not only did God have the power to create something, he had the power 
to sustain everything that he created. Um, this grass around you right here, right now, who thinks it should have been cut this week sometime? Kai does. He's in the lawn care business. Right? What causes this grass to grow? Sun. Hmm. What causes the sun to shine? Nuclear fusion. What causes nuclear fission to be? That's where it stops. <laughs> the laws of physics, good. What's that? Quantum fields? Quantum physics? Quirks and quarks? Did you know that there are, on from what we know now, there are 26 different constants required for the universe to sustain life and existence? Right? Okay. I'm going to say that again because I kind of just like blah, blah, blah over the head. 26 constants. Hey, guys. Come on in. Uh, 26 constants that cannot vary or change. Otherwise, the universe would collapse into nothingness. The question bids, what keeps those laws of physics, quirks and quarks, Nuclear fissions, fashion, blah, 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 things that are above my pay grade. What, what causes those to, to be, to remain constant? Jesus. Jesus sustains all things. There's not a molecule in the universe that is not held together or functioning outside the uh, explicit authority power and will of Jesus. If something is the way it is, Jesus is working it. And it and all things according to the counsel of his will, Paul tells us in Ephesians, to the praise of his glory. Hebrew says the word of his power. What kind of power is this? Like, what can you sustain in your life? Okay, let, let's... What, what can your government sustain? What can the healthcare system sustain? What? And yet, this grass grows, this sun shines by the word and the will of Jesus for his glory. He is not outside of creation spinning plates. This, this is important to understand. Like if you ever feel a bit of chaos in your life and you're working through, does God even care? Know that God is not a God that spins plates, doing the best that he can, and maybe he drops a few and here, a few here and there, and then um, scrambles to make up for, for those losses that he forgot. If, if, think about what Jesus said, not a hair on your head it remains unnumbered by him. Right? There, there's not a flower that um, dresses the field that isn't by his word. There isn't a, a common sparrow that falls in the forest that nobody's ever seen that is outside of his eye. And he cares for that sparrow. Jesus, the sustainer, cares for you. Everything in the universe is dependent on Jesus' word of power. Your next breath. Take a breath. Your next heartbeat is dependent on Jesus, the sustainer of the universe. Why is Jesus, understanding Jesus, knowing Jesus as the sustainer important? 
thankfulness. Someone wiser and more powerful than you is sovereignly reigning over the chaos. The beauty of the story of the Ark of Scriptures is that in the beginning, yes, God created the heavens and the earth, but it doesn't take but two chapters into the book to realize something drastically wrong happened. Chaos entered the world. Rejection of God's authority entered the world. The word was rejected. As the creator, there was every right to wipe it over and begin again. But there was a plan before the foundations of creation that God would redeem a people to himself, that he would sustain the world so that those who hear might believe in him. You see, there's great comfort in knowing Jesus is the sustainer of all things. Everything hasn't collapsed into a black hole because Jesus says no. He declares the sun to shine and the sun shines. So that he can redeem, he will redeem a people to himself. You see, God did not remain outside of creation, but as John says later in chapter 1 of, of John, that the word became flesh. He entered into the chaos that ensued after Genesis 2. The fall of creation does not mean that he lost control of creation. No, he still rules and his recreating process continues today. A recreating process that was magnified when the word became flesh and hung on a tree so that what went drastically wrong in Genesis 3 can point to revelation where God's creation dwells with him in perfect harmony, in worship of him, the very thing we were designed to do. Jesus still rules today, and he's still reigning as he recreates a people for himself until he returns, as we see in Revelation. Until then, he invites everyone in to hear his story that we have been invited into, the story that God created, humanity royally messed it up, but yet there is a royal king, his name is Jesus, who is God, man, who died in our place so that we might place faith and trust in him as creator, sustainer, king over all creation. Later in Hebrews chapter 11, it's interesting to note that this creation thing, remember I'm not saying about how creation happened, just who did it and why he did it. It's not something that any one of us can go back in time. I should write a song. Back in time. Anyways. And see for ourselves creation take place. That's why it's by faith. Hebrews 11.1 1. By faith we believe. Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not yet seen. For by it the people of old received their commendation, people before Christ. And by faith we understand that the universe was created by the word of God, so that what is seen was not made out of things that are visible. The author of Hebrews points to the reality that belief in creator, Jesus, 
the word, the sustainer of the universe, is by faith. We all are invited into this story to understand him better, to understand ourselves better in light of who he is, and turn to him, to our original purpose, to value him more than creation, to image him, to reflect him, believing him and obeying him in all aspects of life. Jesus is the word. He created all things and sustains all things for his glory and invites each and every one of us into that story. So as we journey through the Old Testament, we see a Jesus that even in the midst of rebellion from his people, he sustains all things for his glory to rescue them for his glory. Let me pray. Father, we thank you for your plan of redemption that is so above our pay grade, so above our understanding, our even being worthy of its truthfulness. We thank you that you created what was good, and even though we destroy it by self-centered pursuits. You sustain things so that we might have time to turn to you, to join you in your story of worshiping you. We ask that as we reflect on these things, that there be much rejoicing for Jesus' sake, there would be repenting, turning, living for you, areas of life that were created for your purposes, that we've turned and used for our own purposes. Would you uh, open our eyes to to you, to love you and obey you. For Jesus' sake, in his name I pray. Amen.